Washington columnist for Reuters Breaking Views. We're here for the Horasis panel on COVID caution and capital markets. So amid the pandemic, we've seen stock markets reach record highs with the help of central banks from all over the world, along with fiscal policy. So we're here to talk about how that has changed or not changed investment strategies and where we go from here. And we're very lucky to have a distinguished group of panelists who have years of experience and diverse backgrounds to help us walk through this. I will just briefly introduce them. And if each of you could just raise your hand when I say your name so the audience knows who you are, and then we can uh, dive into the discussion. Uh, so first, uh, we have uh, Wouter Sturkenboom, Chief Investment Officer of Northern Trust Global Investments. And uh, next we have William Hobbs, Chief Investment Officer at Barclays Investment Solutions. We also have uh, Federico Travella, CEO of Novacap. And last but not least, we have George Uju, uh, Chairman of Galileo Global Advisors. So uh, thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, I wanted to start off with sort of a, a high level um, scene setter question, if you will, as We've all been through this lockdown period for a year now, um, and we've seen how uh, central banks from here, where I am in the United States and in Europe and Japan and elsewhere react along with uh, the governments as well. So how has that response um, to COVID affected what you do in your sort of day-to-day -day professional lives? Um, has it changed your investment strategies and do the old paradigms of how you allocate assets, do they work anymore? Do they apply? Um, William, if we can kick it off with you uh, and if each of you could just spend a few minutes talking about that, um, that would be great. William. Uh, yeah, Gina. Um, so that's a good opening question. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the basics of asset allocation haven't really changed, which is that you're looking for assets where, you know, you think there's going to be a positive expected return. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about it, you know, you can't look at the recent past to judge whether that's going to be a positive ex expected return. You need a solid academic intuition for there to be a reward behind owning an asset. Um, and there needs to be some statistical evidence going a bit further back that, you know, there is you know some, there has historically been some reward for owning that asset. And, there needs to be, you know, some degree of, um, you know, if you throw those assets together, that they, um, you know, that there's, there's some, you know, correlation benefits um, that, you know, together they make a better a better whole than they do individually. The, the thing that has changed in the last few years, I think, and, you know, it's one of the big topics at the moment is really the bond market. And I guess, you know, the monetary policy, you know, some would argue that the monetary policy framework of the last few years in particular has really kind of helped take a large chunk of, um, you know, what was previously a very important safe haven in many diversified portfolios off the um, off the kind of long term investors list to a certain extent. It's very difficult or has been very difficult to allocate large chunks of um, uh, you know, your client assets towards the government bond market, you know, with a, you know, definitive negative real return. And, never, you know, that, that's obviously very difficult. So the diversification appeal is, is less as well. And so a lot of asset allocators have been wrestling with that idea, us included, of, you know, what does the other 40% of my bond, of my portfolio look like uh, in a world where government bonds are offering a negative real return? That's one of the major things. But I don't know how much you could attribute that to the sort of policy backdrop. You know, some would argue that independent of policy, you know, interest rates have been falling for years, decades, centuries even, some would argue, and that's happened in all sorts of different policy frameworks. Um, so, yeah, it's certainly an interesting environment right now. That's what I would say. Great. Well, we'll definitely uh, dive into some of those uh, questions about the bond market and, and inflation worries um, during the panel. Uh, but sticking to sort of the high level picture for now, um, Federico, you were also, you know, when we were talking in preparation for the panel, just uh, some of the difficulties now in, in terms of figuring out where, where to put your money. Um, how do you think the government and, and central bank response has affected what you do? Yeah, I mean, my experience has been 
slightly different in, in many ways because uh, my, my firm is, in, is building uh, financial technology, right? So we, um, we are building what we call the operating system for our working capital. So we very much try to support um, small, medium businesses, right? And, and mid-corp seeking for working capital finance um, and that typically don't have access to, to, to capital markets, right? And then on the other side of the equation, um, we work with um, institutional investors, um, which we provide access to a different asset class, right? Which we call digital credit. And so um, I think we, we all hate the, <laughs> the word by now, but it's true that the, the, the response, right? Monetary and fiscal response to COVID has been unprecedented. And so what we've seen is that the corporate world has been flooded with, um, with liquidity. Um, either via uh, capital markets or via you know government guaranteed uh, loan programs, and so that's that's very unique. And of course, I think that that was the right response because it was a way to 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 avoid the collateral damage um, in in economies, right? And um, lowering interest rates further was was much harder because you know, they were already negative. So I think for for my business, um, the experience has been that even you know counterintuitively. Many of our customers uh, today, they have more cash than one year ago, which, which is quite unique, right? Um, especially as if, if we, all, we all know what you know, humanity and the entire world um, has gone through in, in the last year. So it's somewhat crazy. So I think in the short term, um, first of all, our, our goals uh, shifted somewhat, right? So for the provision of day-to-day of -day working capital to, to corporations, we were very selective. Um, we were obviously uh, picking the, 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 the best uh, risk uh, there, there possible. Um, but I think what we are mostly doing there is we're preparing ourselves for that withdrawal right, of uh, fiscal and, and monetary help. And that's when our capital will become very essential to, to SMBs. And we also really want to support the, the real economy then. right? And secondly, um, we all know we cannot change the market. right? Um, but what you can do in business is you can change your product, right? And so in the course of one year, we've developed a new product we call dynamic discounting, which actually is geared towards uh, cash-rich corporations, right? With, with excess liquidity, with, with excess cash on their balance sheet, um, which they can then push back into the supply chain by, by early payment, by, by trade discounts. So this kind of, you know, the opposite world um, of, of, uh, of what, we, what we were doing before. And then on the investment side, in terms of asset allocation, um, we think that, that alternative credit instruments like like ours are even more uh, relevant today to you know, bit what, what Will also mentioned, right? Is because they, they remain fairly unconventional to, to institutional investors, which you know are seeking traditionally those investment grade bonds um, or probably leveraged uh, finance markets. But if 15 trillion of of, um, of today's uh, debt is, is negative yielding, which I think is about you know a quarter or so of the investment grade market then the bonds are gone, right? And that 60-40 uh, allocation strategy doesn't work anymore. And if equities then are as expensive as, you know, uh, Tokyo real estate in uh, 1989, right? Um, then, then it becomes really hard. And so in spite of what we're seeing on, on, on the market, we think that those short-term um, digital credit asset class is going to draw an increasing amount of institutional investors because they want to rebalance that fixed income portfolio. And when that happens, I think we'll be ready and... Uh, and take up more of those uh, those investors. Maybe they won't even let me in. Great. And uh, George, how about you? How how has this uh, changed what you do and, and what your clients want? Sorry, George. I think you're on mute. There you go. Been <laughs> there before. Sorry. So. What struck me in this COVID period is that it has been a revelation of how weak the financial world is. Uh, and uh, we have seen what I call a massive transfer of risks from the private sector to the public sector. And we're talking about uh, an increase, for instance, of the balance sheet of the uh, bank of uh, the, the European Central Bank by 50%. We have seen the Federal Reserve uh, adding basically as much as it did in QE, Q1, Q2, Q3. Uh, the debt of the governments has exploded completely. And so if you start looking at the various elements that are there, 
My main concern is that uh, there will be a moment where uh, either coming from not performing loans, from capital markets and so on, we are going to be facing the moment of truth. The difficulty is that the moment of truth with the kind of amount that we are talking about is huge. So on that basis, uh, I was about thinking about what is it that everybody is trying to do here and why is it that when you listen to central banks, they talk about green financing, they talk about digital currency, and they don't talk about risk. And I believe that what we need to do now is to really shift from what I would call an asset allocation in the traditional sense, where it is where you find the best return and so on, from a sort of risk manager position in everything that you do. Is it the right time to take debt to invest? Is it the right time to leverage your portfolio? Is it the right time to be part of something that is now a almost 300 trillion debt around the world, private and public? And therefore, to me, uh, uh, what, what really bothers me is that we are living in denial. Of course, there are voices who say what I'm saying. But the reality is the people who are responsible, and I'm talking about the authorities, and I'm talking about the public sector, are basically in denial. And if they are not in denial, then they are lying to us, none of which is good news. Well, I'd love to uh, dive into some of that uh, as we continue with our discussion. Um, Wouter, uh, I wanted to ask you as well, um, how has COVID and, and the response to it um, affected your goals in terms of your investment strategies? And, and do you find you had to radically change them because of what's happened over the last year? Thanks, Gina. And as you know, a little bit of connection is um, some, you know, some issues with the connection are uh, difficult to overcome. But if ever, let me just say that the key point for us being. Sorry, Wouter, I think we've lost you there. Sorry. Let's let's just try one more time and then um, if we can't make that work, then we'll. <laughs> and otherwise, I'm just going to leave you guys alone. But um, what we've seen is a shrinkage of the strategic investment horizon towards the tactical as COVID has really accelerated a lot of our strategic themes. So that's been a real feature of this crisis where we've seen the subjugation of uh, monetary policy to fiscal COVID-19, where monetary policy is now basically just a funding device for fiscal policy. We've seen the same with respect to... Sorry, I think we lost water there. So, uh, and I should introduce uh, Jeremy Deal, um, managing partner at JDP Capital Management. He uh, joined us um, just after we got started. So, thanks, Jeremy, for joining Thank us. You. And, Thank you. Um, I should just, if you weren't able to hear um, the first question, we were just going around talking about the monetary and, and fiscal response to COVID and whether that has changed or, or not changed. Um, your investment strategy and sort of what you do day to day. And I think you in particular have an interesting perspective on this. So we'd love to um, get your thoughts on, on how much it, it has or hasn't impacted your, uh, your professional life. Um, yeah. So the, yeah, so I, I guess I would start by saying that, you know, we're, we're making our fund is making three to five plus year investments in companies um, based on very specific business outcomes. It's a really concentrated portfolio. Um, so the approach is more like a, more like a private equity fund than it would be than a traditional hedge fund that's trading um, all the time. And so we're generally dealing with, a, you know, with portfolio companies that are at any given time really overvalued or really undervalued. 
Um, but we have a long term, not not super long term, like I said, three to five year horizon. And we're measuring KPIs um, that are generally non traditional because we're trying to uh, we're making a, an, an investment based on a specific business outcome. And ultimately, it has to tie into the cash flow of, of at, at some future date or a multiple of that and the correct multiple. So the um, from an operational perspective is where we saw the biggest impact in our portfolio. Um, and the, um, some of the companies, it brought forward certain trends, um, that were happening, like for example, streaming, um, connected TV trends and connected TV that, you know, things move forward much faster. People cut the cord a lot faster. Um, and the revenue growth in some of these companies just skyrocketed. Um, now that's, you know, and, and so the valuations, um, responded to that. And so we had to kind of take a look and let's take a step back and say, um, based on this, is this still, uh, is this brought forward everything we understand this company to be over the next three to five years, or is there still a lot more room to go? Um, and so that's been more. And back to valuation, whether interest rates were, you know, 2% or 1% or whatever was, was probably more, a lot less important. Um, but um, I think if you have companies with a lot of leverage uh, that have to be the companies with a balance sheet that need uh, within the next three or four years, it's probably a scary thing. If you own companies that are not really growing and you're just betting on multiple expansion because they didn't go up a lot in 2020, I think that's a scary place to be. Um, so just like I said, uh, I, maybe that's a, a long winded answer to a really basic question, but, um, I, I didn't, we didn't change necessarily anything, um, based purely on, on interest rates going from whatever 3% to, to 50 basis points or whatever, um, from trough to peak or, or peak to trough. It wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't that important. We we're more concerned about the fundamentals of the businesses. So the companies that were sold, a couple of companies were sold because we were just uncertain how long it was going to take before things would normalize again. Yeah. Well, so speaking of normalization, we are all um, at various points on the um, vaccine distribution spectrum. Um, we've gone to maybe just over 100 million People here, um, Europe has been a bit slower. J Japan has also had a bit of a slower start. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, after hopefully we, we reach this period, um, do you expect consumer spending to skyrocket? Will we see something like the roaring 20s um, or Will it be sort of half the roaring 20s um, in, in terms of people still being cautious about um, traveling and, and being uh, outdoors with large crowds of people? You know, how does that then affect um, your outlook in terms of. need to ask and that again that are key to the debate at the moment is one is how is that um how are those pent-up savings distributed amongst the income uh segments you know so in the uk some are arguing that you know pretty much all of the excess savings have accrued to the top 40 percent of the income distribution now the same is true in other countries as well so that will really dictate not only how much of that excess savings is actually spent. We all know that the higher up the income segments you go, um, the lower your marginal propensity to consume or the higher your marginal propensity to save is. Um, but also the more of that which will be splashed on services over goods. Um, so, you know, how you answer that question is very important. The other thing is really, um, there was a piece from the IMF last year and they looked at, you know, this amazing kind of panoramic view looking at all the aftermath of all, um, pandemics since the Black Death. And they argued, you know, they found a strong, you know, surprisingly strong, you know, and enduring after effect, um, statistically robust saying that, you know, growth and inflation is lower 
for decades afterwards, you know, on average, post these, you know, and part of that is, you know, that consumers feel, to your point just now, you know, more need to save for that now very vivid rainy day. So, you know, your baseline should be that savings ratios may be elevated for some time after this. Um, you know, I would make one counteracting point, which is really that, you know, it's not just different this time, it's different every single time. And this pandemic, I think, it is distinct from, you know, his many historic pandemics, primarily because of the healthcare response. You know, go back to 1918 and the physician's toolkit, you know, is well known as, you know, bloodletting, a cancer causing laxative and dry champagne. Um, you know, fast forward to today and you get, you know, the vaccine pretty much in a weekend, you know, we've identified it within weeks. Um, you know, so, so, you know, it's amazing, you know, what the, you know, accumulated scientific knowledge and, you know, the right, res- you know, the right incentives can do. And I think that is something different as well as the policy response, which is really something that is genuinely very, very different. Um, to past crises. So they may inform a totally different um, story. But I think the broad message for me was just be a little bit, you know, keep an open mind as to, you know, how that savings and how much of that savings will actually splash down onto the economy in the second half of the year. Sure. Well, and Federico, I wanted to ask you that as well, because I think you were a bit skeptical too in, in terms of how much would, would really come back, um, you know, that consumers would go back to their old behaviors. We've heard very recently from the Fed as well, right? You can only go out for dinner once every night. Yes. He um, got a lot of pushback on Twitter for, from that. Exactly. So, but, but I think this one is a really tough one because um, traditional um, economics here is not necessarily helpful, right? I mean, I think if you, if you look at a downturn uh, typically, right, and, you know, you sell less um, – um, uh, cars or, or washing machines, right? Um, and then in the, in the years afterwards, during the recovery, you know, you have that catch-up demand, right? And uh, then people, you know, eventually replace their 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 car or their washing machine. Um, but I think today the situation is is, is a bit distinct because um, in many ways um, there's some 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 areas of the economy which are permanently or at least for the foreseeable future lost, right? And uh, many of those services, I think, are part of the experience-focused um, economy of, of, uh, of today's world. So, um, you know, actually taking the, the example of, of, of the Fed, right, in terms of hospitality restaurants, it's not because I haven't been able to eat out in a restaurant for the last, say, six months, right, because they were pretty much closed, that I'm going to eat out in a restaurant every um, every evening in the next couple of, 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 of months, right? And so I think it matters a lot because those rebound um, economics, right, they expect not only a, uh, a return to the mean, right, um, but also typically a catch-up effect. And I think that catch-up effect is, is, is further, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's further um, uh, affected uh, very much because um, that recovery, I think, also is, is very asynchronous, right? I may want to travel to... Um, to Thailand, but um, the, the the country may not just want to accept me because I'm coming from a high risk uh, red red zone, right? So from that perspective, I think um, this this also complicates the matter a lot. And um, what one data point I I I, um, I find very interesting is um, is is actually post 9/11 uh, flight data, right? Which obviously was um, you know 2001 2001 event, which was highly concentrated in many ways, the way it affected the economy, right? It was pretty much affecting the U.S. domestic aviation industry and more specifically New York. Um, but it took about five years to recover uh, U.S. domestic flights from, from 9-11, so um, to, to the pre, uh, pre-high of, of 9-11. So that's a very long period uh, of time. And I think today a much wider group of people is affected, right? Pretty much everyone, that, that is the reality. So I think from that perspective, we may see um, some of that disposable income getting stuck much longer because some of some part of the economy um, or population better is, is not going to travel. So um, from an investor perspective, I think the softer than expected recovery um, uh, means, at least for my business, which is counter-cyclical, that more financing solutions will be needed, right? So from that perspective, we, 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 are, we are bullish in, in, in that sense on business-wise. Um, but um, I think, generally speaking, what, what I would recommend is to, to stay higher up in the capital stack, right? That, that's what we're trying to do because um, it does mean that, you know, leveraged loans, for instance, um, or re- refinancings that have happened a lot in the last year, right? 
which are eventually assuming a very uh, positive uh, recovery of the company in the next uh, next couple of years may turn out to be much riskier than expected. So from that perspective, we remain more short dated um, and then higher up into the, the, the capital uh, stack. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, George, I also wanted to dig into um, some of the concerns that you raised initially. I mean, we just saw uh, the Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell talk yesterday about how he's definitely most not taking the punch bowl away and he will repeat it, you know, 10 times until he's blue in the face. Um, We've seen uh, Congress just pass a nearly $2 trillion um, aid package and people here, millions of people uh, in the United States are now getting their uh, $1,400 COVID checks. So I want to ask you a bit more about sort of the concerns uh, that you have on that front. Um, are, you, are you worried about asset bubbles? Are you worried about the economy overheating? And I hope we still have them. Uh, there you are, George. Um, are, what are your primary concerns as you you talked about, you know, the, the risk being transferred and, and policymakers being in denial? I think that uh, if I were uh, picking up two, two issues that are very close to my preoccupation, the first one is indeed that because we are for 10 years, the central banks, have been pouring money to try to revive inflation. The problem is that there was no reason for inflation and the economy didn't follow, raw materials didn't follow, nothing followed, and they don't take the lesson out of it. But they have created an asset inflation of enormous proportion. So, the problem that I have today is that the economists who are there are still fighting yesterday's inflation, but they will be responsible for the asset inflation because it is a bubble. I mean, we have to be totally honest with ourselves. How big is the bubble? We are missing something very important, is that we have been living now for a year under perfusion of liquidity of the central banks and stimulus of the governments. Perfusion is not a good solution to know how bad the landscape is. And it's like, you know, uh, when you have a water flow, it's when the water leaves that you start seeing what is the damage. And to a certain extent, we have to be very careful because we don't know how much damage has been done. But let me introduce a second dimension to what we are talking about. And it is something that I'm spending more and more time and, uh, working on is the following. The disconnect between capital markets and the average citizen has never been wider. The inequality of wealth has exploded during the COVID. Capital markets. Sorry, George. Okay, there you are. Do you hear me? Sorry, go on. We we just lost you. Because I was interested, I saw. Uh, and we have to think about what the role of the capital markets is. Whether we should only focus on shareholder value, or whether it's time to be serious about stakeholder value. And I think that that, the ESG, climate change, and so on, there are a lot of movements that are happening. But I think that uh, the problem of public trust and the impression that there is nothing for them in this world, and the problem of public trust is, to me, the biggest damage of COVID, because we've seen of governments unable to fight the pandemics. And although they put money they didn't resolve some of the problems. And a year later, we still don't have enough beds for the people. And uh, we are doing much better now with the vaccine in the US. But when you see what's happening in Europe, in terms of vaccine, even in Japan, it's pretty worrying about management of the economy. 
Garmy, I wanted to turn to you and, and ask um, if you're worried at all about overheating or, or asset bubbles, especially because the way I think that you look at investing um, is a bit different and you're not sort of paying attention as much to, you know, the latest FOMC meeting or, uh, you know, what, what Christine Lagarde just said. Uh, so in terms of your perspective, um, are, are you worried at all about, uh, about asset prices and, and where they're at? You know, there's always been um, a portion of the market that's really overvalued since I've been in business and even before, you know, when I was still kind of cutting my teeth, I mean, the, as long as I can remember, um, there's always been a portion. So you can either f- choose to focus on the portion that's really overvalued or the portion that's really undervalued or the portion with high quality or low quality. That's the benefit of being a public company investor and being a stock picker and making a, you know, a long-term investment in something. But yeah, there's companies that are really overvalued. And during when, during days of big drawdowns, they all kind of come down together. And you need to have a shareholder. In order to do that, in order to successfully hold on, you need to have a shareholder base that, that kind of understands what you're doing. And it's, uh, it's not for the faint. It's not for the, it's not for the weak. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of overpriced stuff out there, for sure. There always has been. There probably always will be. Um, there's also stuff that trades statistically very, very, very cheap. There's kind of something for everybody. So, um, you know, I live in Europe, but I invest in the U.S. and, and have a U.S. fund. And, um, you know, I look around, I see very, really, really different situation here in Amsterdam, for example, in this part of Europe than, than the areas that I invest in the U.S. And um, from a macro perspective, I do see two really different different, uh, you know, two different recovery, um, two, two speeds of different, of recovery. Um, and I also see asset bubbles here, uh, and real estate. I mean, the real estate market where I live has just been on fire, just like it is everywhere. There's just been complete panic buying. Um, and the prices are just insane relative to people's income. It's something like <clears throat> a third of the price to, to buy a home in terms of payments than it would be to lease it. <clears throat> And I, th- I worry about that kind of stuff. Um, you know, low interest rates have all kinds of problems, but I don't see how, for example, Europe is just going to just start raising rates. And um, I wonder if the, if the kind of a global global rates of being really low, um, it puts a lid on what could happen in the U.S. because somebody's got to be buying these things. Somebody's got to be buying if the 10 years at 2%. I don't see how it, uh, people just can't buy it. Um, if, you know, if they're coming from a country with negative interest rate or a very, very low interest rate, if they're in Germany, if they're in, if they're in France or from the Netherlands, I don't know how central banks don't buy that or how people don't invest in that. So, um, yeah, there's, there's bubbles. Um, there's, it's just, I think you got to own the right stuff and know why you own it and, and have, and have a real clear understanding of what that is and be realistic. I mean, it feels great to be up so much on our home in Amsterdam, but I, also understand that it's a result of, of artificial, I mean, people are earning more necessarily this year than they were five years ago, but yet the real, real estate has gone up in some places like our neighborhood, you know, two, three X during that period of time. And it, it's just, it's just unbelievable to me um, that I can buy a, buy a place and do a hundred percent financing. Not that we did, but if we did a hundred percent financing, that it would be a fraction of the cost to rent it. Um, so yeah, I, I do agree that there's the enormous disconnect between, um, markets and the average kind of person on the street with a normal job making 55,000 euros a year, um, in their late four, late thirties with a family. Um, it's just, it's very difficult for them to get a leg up. And a lot of this is policy is going to have to react. You're going to have pay back all this debt. Taxes are going to go up, you know, here they have a wealth tax, uh, and they don't have capital gains tax, but they have a wealth tax. It's very high. And it punishes the, the smaller guy. The, it punishes the smaller family. So um, because it has an implicit, it has an implied return of something that's completely, uh, it doesn't even exist anymore, a return for the average person that, that reflects an old, old time when interest rates were much, much higher. So, yeah, I do agree that there's, um, 
there's there's bubbles and there's um, there's a lot of assets, especially in the private market. I mean, the leverage buyouts that I follow and friends with private equity, I see the multiples paid for melting ice cube type divestitures of public companies. And I go, my God, you're paying 12 times EBITDA for that, like melting ice cube of a business, a divestiture from XYZ, you know, big public company and the leverage that, you know, the big banks will will let them take on. It's just remarkable. It's just unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I see not just bubbles in the stock market. It's really easy to point to, oh, look at this XYZ battery company. But outside of the stock market, um, I see low growth businesses that are just gr- that are getting more and more expensive based purely on, on the multiple expansion. And and to me, when I think about the average common common Joe, so to speak, I, I, I worry more about them in, 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 in terms of. For example, overvalued real estate um, and overvalued companies that are private equity owned that that they work for that potentially could blow up if things go wrong. Well, so William, I wanted to ask you, uh, following on that, um, what what should policymakers do about some of these issues? I mean, in the U.S. and and can, Increasingly across the rest of the world, we're seeing, you know, this craze over SPACs. Um, We've had, uh, I think now, uh, not even the the first quarter isn't even over yet um, this year. And already the amount of money raised in these special purpose acquisition companies has outstripped the total that was raised in 2020. And, you know, it's like these companies that have no revenue, uh, falling revenue. I mean, it's just, it's crazy, but it feels, it, it does feel very frothy and, um, you know, regulators are starting to look at, at some of these issues. We've seen GameStop and the um, surge of retail investors uh, in, in some of these stocks that, you know, hardly saw any volume before, um, you know, is, is there a place where they should, be stepping in at some point um, because of these sort of this growing disconnect um, between the capital markets and, and the real economy. Yeah, God, there's a lot in there, Gino. <laughs> yeah. But the guys have made some great hot points. topics. Yeah, a lot of topics. I'll, I won't do any of them justice. I'll do some superficial points on all of them. But I, I just, you know, the guys have made some great points there. And I, I just wanted to sort of, you know, try and answer that and touch on those and do a bit of that. So in terms of sort of, you know, access to capital markets, I totally agree with George that, the, that you know, it needs to be, it can't just be the richest parts of society that have got their savings tethered to a faster horse. You know, that is just going to widen wealth equality in the years to come. Um so, you know, part of the whole thing that at the moment is that should be about democratizing access to capital markets. And, you know, the industry's made huge progress in this. You know, accessing diversified capital markets has never been cheaper. Um, you know, so you're, you know, thinking about it, it, it's really never been a better time to be an investor in many ways because your net return from stocks, you know, the costs of, you know, if you go pre-1950s, the costs of assembling, maintaining a diversified portfolio of stocks, your returns are eaten. You know, now you can get that access for almost free. So, you know, A, it's a great start. So it's really about an educational job. And I think it starts at school, you know, really about the relationship between capital markets, what you can expect, what you can't. And remember, you know, that in a way, when we talk about long term diversified portfolio kind of returns, what you're accessing is future human ingenuity. It's not anything else. There's not timing markets. None of us can predict the future. That's never been, you know, we can all gaze into the crystal ball, squint into the crystal ball as hard as we like. We'll never be able to see much about the road ahead. What we can do, I think, is make an educated guess based on a reasonable assessment of history, which is that humankind will continue to invent new stuff and get better at using that new stuff. That will translate into profits. Now, at certain times, There will, you know, the cost of accessing all of that future innovation will be prohibitive. I don't think that moment is now personally, but there'll be disagreement from others. I can, you know, that, that, that's always the case. It takes many views to make a market. But remember, like that incredible vaccine story we just talked about, you know, that, that ingenuity, that's what you're accessing in a sense. That's the very simple story that you're trying to get to. Now, you know, the other point about sort of GameStop and some of the other things, I think that again is an education piece. You know, what you don't want to portray markets as is a kind of, you know, win or bust kind of bet on a single stock. You know, there's no need, you know, 
having a macho bet on a singular vision of the future that's long been proved to be an idiotic way to invest uh you know that's why you know the time that my team save gazing into the crystal ball we devote to mathematically imagining hundreds of thousands of different viable futures some involving inflation some not you know and you find the mix of assets that sits ro most robustly in all of them now it's a bit boring it's less sexy than some of the kind of GameStop or Bitcoin kind of rises. But I think that is the point. It's like having a realistic assessment of what you can get from markets. Personally, I don't think we're in a bubble. But, you know, like I say, there'll, there'll be all sorts of different views on that. I can make, you know, at, at, at the aggregate market level, I don't think things look that ridiculous. I don't think it looks deleterious to returns, potentially. I don't think there's bits that I wouldn't go, you know, as much as I would have in the past, you know, the government bond market. But I still think the returns to future human ingenuity are sufficiently attractive relative to cash for everyone yeah, to try and get involved. And if I could just comment on that, Will, I, and, and I, I, I just want to echo, I, I, I don't want to come across like I'm, you know, uh, a bearish at all. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, from a, from a, from especially where you sit, if, if you look at the S&P 500, which is our benchmark, the only thing that really matters in the S&P 500 going back to its inception is the top 50 companies. Um, we have gone through periods in the past where the top 50 companies has become a, a large percentage of the total. And I believe in the 1970s and the early 1980s, it was actually more concentrated than it is today, the top three, IBM, uh, Exxon. And so really what the bet is, if, you're, if you have a benchmark or if you're just going to own the, the, the S&P total return, in my case as a U.S. investor, and maybe in, in some different Europeans case, it's the DAX or whatever large index they want to own or the LSE, but it's, it's the top 50 companies. And if you look at the top 50 companies in the S&P 500, of course, there's going to be a couple losers there. But you're, what are you buying? You're buying Amazon. You're buying Apple. You're buying so the most amazing companies in the world with enormous amounts of cash, enormous amounts of cash flow, enormous amounts of IP and assets. And relative to cash, it is a better deal. Um, you don't see Berkshire Hathaway necessarily, you know, you don't see them dumping all their Apple stock, for example, even though it's become their largest position. Um, I think there was like an 11, a very small, uh, a sale. And then there was a big buyback. So they equated each other or something. But I think my, absolutely. If you're faced with like, do I pay a wealth tax in Holland and, 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 or, and, and pay cash, have cash sit in a negative interest rate checking account, or do I invest in, the top 50 companies in the S&P 500 or just the S&P 500, it's, it's not a bad situation at all. And I don't see Amazon just going down 90% and you're just like, oh my God, this is 1999 all over again. Of course, you can look way down in the S&P and find bad companies, crap companies, things that are going to fall apart or whatever that you couldn't get your money back on. But if you're just a high level investor looking at a diversified portfolio of really high quality companies, it is an amazing time to be an investor because the innovation is just, it's just, um, we're innovating at a, at a pace we've never been able to, we've never been able to, to, to we've never seen before. And traditional accounting um, just can't catch up with it. You know, the IP that some of these companies generate is just not, you're not going to be able to see it in a, in a balance sheet. Um, well, so we're, we're running out of time and I was hoping I could uh, ask all of you this, but um, in the interest of time and trying to get to some questions, um, I will just ask uh, Federico then <laughs> this question just in terms of as you look ahead, um, as you see, you know, various governments and, and businesses um, sort of move hopefully past this point of the pandemic, what is the, the one thing that you're hopeful about and what's the one thing you're most concerned about from an investment perspective? Okay, I'll, I'll take the hopeful one first. So I think, um, I think, yeah, what, what, what brings me a lot of hope and also, um, excites me is that, that, uh, we're, we're, you know, science here is, is clearly winning, right? I think we've, we've delivered a vaccine in record, uh, tempo. And, um, I think that's a great win for humanity. I think also the, the, I'm a scientist actually as, uh, by training myself. And I think it, it brings back some, some respect for, for, for that profession. And, um, and, and, you know, which, you know, for instance, in the U S science uh, or the respect for science was missing for quite some time, um, with, especially with the previous presidency. Um, and I think that, that, that's, uh, that's going to change in, in the next coming years where I guess I'm a little bit more uh, concerned about is, um, the amount of, 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 uh, of money that entered the economy, right? 
um, you know, last year um, during you know, specific periods of time, more than a billion of, um, of assets were purchased by central banks an hour per, per hour, right? So that, that, at that pace, you know, uh, we, we've printed, I think, about one third of the global GDP in one year. Um, so my concern is really much, you know, what is the aftermath, right? What's the afterplay, right? Um, how long will it take to, to withdraw that extraordinary support and, and what sort of bad surprises uh, will we encounter when, uh, when we withdraw from, from uh, that, uh, that endless uh, fiscal and monetary support we provide? So um, from that perspective, I think um, that will be my, my, uh, my main concern. And I hope, uh, you know, the, the worst that could happen is that we go into, you know, some sort of uh, fiscal austerity like we've seen with, with Greece and, and other uh, economies uh, post 2008, I think that is the situation we should really try to, to avoid to, to, yeah, to the extent possible. Okay, great. Well, um, we are almost out of time, so I will just ask one question uh, from the audience. And um, George, I will hand it over to you. Um, we have a, a question just about the markets and basically how long.